Welcome again to A World on the Move, the program where we enter into the important issues of refugees and migrants. The UN Summit has been looking at these really important issues for the first time. So the issue of migration is now center stage before the international community. And today, again, we have refugees and migrants from around the world, really interesting characters. And we have a great pleasure to have with me the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Jan Eliasson. We're going to look today at the issues of what it's like to be a refugee or a migrant in another country. What are the issues of integration that are important? And why is xenophobia and the politics of identity so coloring our contemporary politics? Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to join you. Uh, this is a very important meeting uh, that we finally put migration and refugee flows on the top of the UN agenda with a quarter of a billion people are international migrants uh, living and working in places where they are not born. And uh, I think uh, if we don't have a uh, global outlook on this uh, and find uh, the, the work, base our work both on efficiency and solidarity, I think we will be in deep trouble. And I really enjoy this being with you and having the human perspective on migration and uh, migrants' lives. So uh, this is uh, an important occasion for us to also bring out the message to the world that the UN cares about migration and refugee flows. So let's at this stage, maybe we'll turn to Afsun, who has a really interesting profile because she's of, of uh, Iranian origin and left the country as a three-year-old smuggled in the back of a car into, into Pakistan. But now you, live, now you live and work in Canada, which is in a particularly interesting place when it comes to integration, because as we know, we've accepted a vast number of refugees this year, and the country is particularly open to creating opportunities for, for migrants. Perhaps you could talk to us, Afsun, a little bit about your personal experience. Uh, yes, thank you for having me. I just on a personal note, Mr. Elias, and I want to say what an honor it is for me to speak with you because, um, as Leonard mentioned, I was born in Tehran during the Iran-Iraq war, and that war and the revolution that preceded it have defined the course of my life from the very day that I was born when my mother risked not having access to a hospital because of the airstrikes. And I know that at that same time, you and your team were working very hard to end the war. And for that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. And my comments uh, today, I've, I have reflect, reflected a great deal on what has caused my experience to be a positive and empowering one. And it has to do with the role of citizens in the receiving population. And I'll give you an example of when I was five years old, a moment I will never forget. I was told we're going to a church and someone called St. Nicholas is going to be there. And I remember sitting in something like the 10th row and watching the kids in front of me and this man in a red suit coming out on stage and calling out the names of the kids and giving them gifts. And I sat there horrified and so sad because I thought, St. Nicholas doesn't know me. He doesn't know I'm here. He doesn't know my name. How I'm, I'm not going to get a gift. And all the other kids were so happy. And I was just sitting there like practically in tears. And then all of a sudden, I hear Afsoon. And you cannot believe, I mean, I will never forget this moment. And I just jumped up and ran to the stage and got the pencil crayons and ran back to my parents. And who was sitting next to them? My parents' English teacher. And later I realized, you know, my parents' English teacher had sat down and explained, this is Christmas and we're going to go to church and we're going to say prayers. And, you know, this is St. Nicholas. And then three months later, when it was no ruse, then we invited her to our house and said, this is our half scene. And, you know, we eat, you know, uh, uh, rice with fish. And, you know, this, these are our customs. And that um, exchange and the friendship that formed is is pivotal because um, it had a profound effect on both sides. It had an effect on the people that surrounded us because they saw us as people who could make a contribution to their community. And so they told their friends about it and their friends told their friends about it. And this is how a positive story, a positive narrative was born. And so I know that you've talked about the need for funding um, to meet the needs of newcomers. And you've talked about um, the beauty of diversity and uh, the need to promote an understanding of it. It's not only that, that direct contact also helps people learn the language organically. It helps people make connections that are essential for employment. It helps create mentorship that 
people need for educational opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, it's remarkable to sit here 2016 and um, see you uh, being a child when I was mediating in the war between Iran and Iraq. And we have this conversation. I think it's very important that we uh, recognize that in today's world, uh, the world exists uh, in our own countries. Uh, and the our nation states are also part of the world. I spoke at the National Day in Sweden, uh, my home country, 2014. And I said, remember, the world uh, is, Sweden is in the world. And I, I was reminding of names like Doug Hammarskjöld, former Secretary General Olof Palme, the champion for peace, and also mediator in Iran, Iraq. Then I said, remember also that the world is in Sweden. Sweden is the world, but the world is in Sweden. In today's world, we have also the world inside our countries. And my view is that those countries who recognize that will be the stronger countries in the longer run. And that means that we have to work on attitudes and look at the mutual benefit of having this conversation. I don't say that it's an easy process. That would be wrong because a country that is well organized and suddenly you have an influx of great numbers of refugees is not easy. But we should understand it as a challenge, not as a problem and peril. There's enormous potential uh, and, and uh, promise in this bringing the world into our own countries. So I think we are at a historic stage where we must have a concept of this nature that I just described, but also put it on the human level and make sure that you have this exchange between people like we just heard from, from your wonderful experience in Canada. And by the way, I am personally going to be Santa Claus in Sweden <laughs> on the 24th of December. That's one of the main reasons that I will have to leave before the end of my term. Um, so I, I, I was born in Liberia, um, but I, I grew up in Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone um, as a child escaping um, different conflicts. Actually, in um, 92, my parents had the opportunity for us to come to, to the UK, but um, we chose to go back and help with um, rescuing um, you know, people who had been stuck in different, in, in different countries during the, 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 the conflict. Help them go back into education, help them secure employment and help them um, to help to raise their aspirations with the right investment and support they would be able to make better contributions to their communities. And I think with migration, um, it, I split my time between Sierra Leone and, and the UK, where I, I, I work in both places. And sometimes in Sierra Leone, when I, the way I say things, the way I, I hear people think I, I have become too British. And sometimes when I'm in, 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 the, in, in the UK and I interact with people, my, Af my African and Sierra Leone insight still comes up. But there are, there are things from both cultures that I learned that I bring together and that enables me to be able to contribute to, um, um, to life and community in the UK and in, and, and in Sierra Leone. Well, thank you very much. I, I think, uh, first of all, it's great that you uh, work with uh, schools, that you work with education, the best investment in the future. Uh, I saw the statistics coming out of Syria. Uh, before the war, 94% of the children went to school. Now, during the conflict, it's gone down to 60. And I think that's even a little bit higher than the realities on the ground and the conditions under which they work. And then secondly, I, I was thinking when you spoke about your being seen as British when you were in Sierra Leone, that I think we should get used to looking at the word identity and come to the realization that that is a much better word in plural. We have several identities. You should not lose your roots in Liberia, uh, but now you have been educated in the UK, you are a bridge. Uh, between uh, two countries, two, two cultures, two traditions. And I would say that you who represent that bridge uh, actually have a, a bit of a richer background than many of us. And I think that is so important now that we uh, use the power of the diaspora, people who have moved into our countries with sometimes extremely high difficulties and then succeeded, that they should be also the bridge to their original countries. I think there is a tremendous dynamics in this. And uh, you can be also playing a similar role 
back in the UK, bringing your experience from Liberia to to the uh, to to UK. So I, I just say that this uh, this uh, dynamics that is coming from the migration uh, hasn't quite been uh, discovered and detected. We need to do that in today's world where there is so much manipulation of fear and the outside and those who come in and it's used in this strategy of fear which is coming from extremist groups and we have now to mobilize the good forces. We have to mobilize the good forces. Uh, and the good forces are those who deal with the outside world as a reality and see how we are all enriched by diversity. I was a 12-year-old boy when the military coup came in Chile and arrested my father, and I was a displaced child at that time. But I, listening to you, what I hear is that the possibilities of migration, what, are motiva what motivate migrants? to improve their life. One of them is the aspiration to continue, to continue dreaming. In 2013, half of the new patents registered in the US were registered by migrants or refugees to the United States. That shows an incredibly amount of driving force, motivation, inspiration by migrants. We have the will we have survived something, we have changed something, and we are willing to contribute in these new societies. Well, I think you made uh, some very important points. Uh, to be uh, really global citizens need to take in the world and uh, see this as a resource and not as a burden, as many unfortunately political forces now try to do. So I'm just the first one to agree uh, with you fully. And uh, I know also I can't refrain from saying how much I have enjoyed my Chilean friends in Sweden, uh, those whom we helped out 1973, thanks to our great ambassador Edelstam in uh, Chile, but also with Prime Minister Palme and uh, us who were really working on the barricades. And these co uh, conversations I've had with you have been truly enriching and uh, inspired me for the meeting uh, and its continuation above all uh, and uh, confirmed that we are on the right track with this work both on migration, refugees and fighting xenophobia. So thank you to all of you. So it's been a great pleasure to have you with us today. Yeah. And, uh, and let me also say how happy I am to see IOM becoming part of the uh, UN family. It's about time. It's and about I time. think also it uh, sends the message that migration indeed is a truly a central part of the new global landscape.